Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Language of Leadership podcast. I'm so excited to have AMAC, Alex Maceda, here with me today. Hey, Matt, AMAC, how are you doing? I'm great, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. We're really excited and honored that you're taking your time to be with us today from beautiful Joshua Tree. So can you tell us a little bit about where you are right now? Yes. Um, so I am in my home slash art studio in Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree is a big desert in Southern California, about 45 minutes south of Palm Springs, two hours south of LA. Uh, so I've been living and working here for about six or seven months, but coming here for almost 10 years. And I'll, I'll just tease it at that, but I'm excited to dive in more to whatever you want to hear about, about the desert. Amazing. Well, I know that some of your beautiful artwork, which we'll dive into in a moment, including one that's in the backdrop of this very shot, mm -hmm. um, it can be inspired by the desert. So can you just share with us a little bit about how you moved to Joshua Tree? And I think it has to do with a pandemic and some art and yes. uh, the NFT rapidly evolving art and crypto space. It's a really amazing story. I'd love for everyone yes. to hear. Um, it is a wild story. Uh, and I was just being reminded that about, so I guess I'll start with about two years ago, almost to the date, I quit my last startup job. So a bit about me. I am Filipino American. I grew up here in California. Uh, I have always loved art since I was a little kid. I even studied art in college, um, but I didn't grow up with any artists in my family. Both my parents are immigrants, uh, super, super supportive, but it was the kind of thing where it was like I was smart enough to get into a quote unquote good school. I went to Dartmouth with you. Uh, so I went to, you know, a four year college. Um, I thought I wanted to go into fashion. That was for me kind of like the art type business thing. Uh, ended up in management consulting and I basically had a 10 year career in business. Uh, so I started in kind of a very, very business management role moved into fashion startups, got really, really interested in kind of consumer work um, and started to get into branded marketing, which I don't know how familiar everyone is kind of with different career paths, but branded marketing for me was kind of like the most creative thing you could do in startups. Um, and to the point that I even, I was in business to the point I even got my MBA from Stanford. Um, and after that, even went to another startup. I was working at a mental health startup and I'm happy to talk about my mental health journey. But anyways, long story short, um, I was absolutely an overachiever, but always, always loved art. I used to take art classes after work and on the weekends. And when I quit my job a couple years ago, I was pretty burnt out and wanting to do something more creative. And I didn't actually know what that was. Um, so when I left my role, uh, it was February 2020. I had no idea it was about to be a global pandemic. I had four months of travel planned. I was going to see my family in the Philippines. Long story short, that didn't happen, obviously. Um, and I got trapped in my apartment in San Francisco. Oh, so man. I was doing some freelance work and I started painting, which I always loved. I started painting every day and I painted, started putting my paintings on Instagram, which was very scary. But Next thing I knew, one person bought one and then another one. And then fast forward about a year later, and I was finding myself making more money from painting than I was freelancing. Wow. Overlaid in that time uh, because I couldn't really fly anywhere. I started coming to Joshua Tree, which is about a seven hour drive from San Francisco, um, painted outside for the first time and was so inspired that I just started coming almost every month and I ended up finding a little house down here. Uh, I bought it six months ago. I'm a homeowner now. Um, and it became my first uh, house and art studio. And when I made that move, uh, for me, it was kind of like a symbolic commitment to my creative practice. Um, and I just became a full-time artist last month. That is such an amazing story. And there's so many different courageous moments therein, um, you know, not only jumping off the beaten path, but really taking the plunge and posting your work, sharing it openly, which I know is a big hurdle for many people to jump over. W would it be possible just to share with us a little bit more about some of those key moments of courage and bravery and fortitude that you've, yeah. uh, that you've made and kind of how that decision-making process worked? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's such, I mean, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, maybe to start with kind of the easiest one, the last one you mentioned, posting my art. Um, so I know that we're going to be talking about leadership. And I think as I've grown older, I used to think leadership was being the strongest person in the room, but I've now started associating being the strongest person in the room with being the person who's willing to be the most vulnerable. And that has been a huge part of my journey. Um, especially when I was growing up and even at Dartmouth, uh, I kept things very close to the chest. Uh, I kind of, I grew up in a Roman Catholic Asian household. So caginess was kind of like in our nature. <laughs> um, but anytime something was hard, it was kind of like a suck it up and just do it type of thing. Um, and that came back to bite me a lot of times in my life. Uh, and I can get into that, but as it relates to art, uh, I think one of the things that was really scary when I was first starting out was uh, I had been, I had achieved so much at every point in my life. I got into a great business school, great college, and I didn't know if I was going to be good at being an artist. And at that point, I was 31. And the idea of starting over and being the newest person and not being the best person kind of in the room was incredibly scary. Um but there was just a part of me that felt like if I don't do it, I'm always going to regret it and I'm always going to wonder. Uh, so even just posting my art at first was kind of a big step. It was like a step, right? Like every time you share yourself, you have the possibility that people are going to reject you. But mm. you also, if you never share yourself, no one can really fully accept you. And that was kind of one of the big shifts in thinking I had. So wow. I started sharing my work. Uh, I remember even first posting it, I would like turn off my phone and leave it in the other room because I would post it and then delete it because I would get so scared. Um, but as I started doing that, uh, I was really surprised, shocked even at how many people who I knew from college reached out to me uh, saying, oh, I've always wanted to do that, or that's so cool, or I always thought you were so good at drawing. Like, I always wondered when you were going to do that. I kind of told- Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I kind of told myself, like, no one was going to care and no one's going to like it, but the community kind of came up to support me. Um, so that was that was kind of like a big, a whole big process for me, I think. I found a lot of times in my life, I am actually the meanest voice in the room. It's like I tell myself all the <laughs> bad things that are going to happen. But when I actually put myself out there, even when bad things do happen, they're so much worse or so much less worse than what I imagined. Um, so for me, it has been kind of a journey at doing that, being vulnerable, being open to failing, mm -hmm. but also being open, more open to people kind of seeing me and being accepted. Well, to to dive in on on that exact point of vulnerability, I, I know this is something that's really meaningful to you. Not only you you just spoken about it, but also you've dedicated a portion of your professional work towards mental health and building awareness and accessibility for that. But would it be possible to kind of connect that a little bit to, as you mentioned earlier, your your family upbringing and maybe some of the pressures you had, maybe when you were a, a teenager. And then looking back now, how that's sort of evolved. Yeah. I understand that that's a personal question, no, but to the extent that you're willing to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I grew up in a Filipino-American household, a very, very conservative Roman Catholic family, extremely loving, love my family. I'm the oldest of four, um, but I had a lot of kind of the dynamics you might hear about. I was the oldest sibling. Uh, I was super high achieving. Um, I worked really hard. I kind of did everything. Mm -hmm. Even when I was in college, I was still like doing everything. Yep. I remember um, that. <laughs> being everywhere. <laughs> um, and I kind of grew up, honestly, I, my parents never explicitly told me this, but kind of what I sensed from how everything was interacting was, especially when you're the oldest of four and there's like a lot of kids running around. I had this persona, for lack of a better word, of like being the responsible one. Mm -hmm. I was the oldest sibling. I had to make sure my siblings were okay. And I kind of learned from an old early age to just deal with, put whatever stuff, personal stuff I had to the side mm. and deal with it. 
um, deal with it separately and not complain. Um, and I found uh, as I grew up, I even kind of took that on in my friend groups. I remember wow. uh, my freshman year in college, uh, there was a big kind of cyber bullying thing. I don't, I hope this doesn't happen anymore, but uh, there was, I don't know if you remember Juicy Campus, which was oh, wow. a college gossip website oh, wow. yeah. uh, for all of you people listening now. Uh, a now defunct college gossip website where people would post anonymously about students. Uh, and as a freshman girl, there were a lot of freshman girls who had really awful things mm. written about them. And it completely destroyed some of my friends. Mm. Um, and I remember feeling like it didn't affect me. Um, and I was kind of like the friend that was holding the other friend crying, even though there was also mean things written about me. Um, and I share that because at the time I was so attached to this persona of like being the strong one. And it wasn't until many years later where I was like, oh, that actually affected me a lot. And I wasn't able to talk about it. Um, and that kind of relates to the, my, my, my mental health journey. I uh, was diagnosed with depression uh, in my mid twenties. At the time I had this kind of like high powered New York City job. Uh, everything looked okay on the outside. Um, but I felt really, really terrible. Um, t and terrible to the point where I was like, I know this isn't normal. But I didn't uh, kind of how I grew up is n no one went to therapy and mental health what therapy was very frowned upon even. It was kind of seen as this thing that like messed up kids went to. Um, and was never portrayed to me as something that was empowering or normal. It was very much like, oh, you deal with your own problems. Um, and if you can't, something's wrong with you. Um, maybe not that harsh, but that's at least how it felt to me when I was younger. There's a, th there's a stigma against it or about it, uh, 100%. Absolutely. And even in some cultures more than others, mm -hmm. right? And I would venture to say, I mean, it has changed a lot, Um even from when I first started going to therapy in 2013 to now, it's so much more widely accepted, at least here in the States. Mm -hmm. But I think in the Philippines, uh, it is on it's only starting to get accepted more as something normal. I think our, our generation is doing a lot to change that. Um, but in 2013, it was really not something that people talked about. Um, and the reason no, you would you would say to somebody, oh, I have a doctor's appointment, but you exactly. never say, oh, I'm going to my, my therapist. Exactly. Um, and honestly, the only reason I went is my roommate at the time had gone to therapy and she was very open about it. And she was the first mm. person I saw where I was like, I identify with this person and I respect this person. So if she goes to therapy, like maybe I could go too, and maybe that would help me. Um, and that was I that was kind of like the big unlock in my life. So I started going to therapy. Uh, it really, really helped with my feelings of depression. And I, I mean, for me, depression was without getting like too much into it. Like it, mm. it was kind of like a lens through which every, everything I saw changed. Uh, the simplest things like having coffee or going to work, everything just felt so hard to manage. Um, but the moment I asked for help and then there's a little fly, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I, it was kind of like the first time in my life, really, I had allowed myself to ask for help and receive help. Um, and that was in 2013. And honestly, uh, it, it got better, but I was kind of in and out of depressive episodes for the next, uh, seven or eight years. Um, mm. And how that evolved is when I was at Stanford Business School, I had a very bad depressive episode and I felt really ashamed because I felt like I had gone through it multiple times and that it shouldn't be happening anymore. Um, but I had really supportive community that kind of came up around me and allowed me to speak about it for the first time. I gave a talk to my class about my experience with depression uh, so it was like 300 people and I spoke about Amazing. it and so many people reached out to me after. And, you know, as, as things go that week, 
a mental health company reached out to me without knowing that I had any kind of personal, you know, history with mental health. And it was a company called Two Chairs uh, that um, built therapy clinics in San Francisco. And they offered me kind of a half creative, half strategic job where I would run marketing. I would design, do the interior design for all of their clinics. Um, so it kind of like everything aligned. Draw a lot of things together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I worked there for two years right before pursuing art. Uh, and I think like the, to kind of go back to your original question, um, one of the things that really clicked for me and kind of going back to like how vulnerability has kind of changed my view of leadership is I thought a lot about how really the, the reason why I was willing to go to my first therapy appointment was because my friend had told me she went. And Mm. was because kind of exactly to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, I had never, I didn't have any role models that I saw that did that. And I thought that meant people like me didn't do that. Uh, When Mm. really I, as I kind of have become more and more open with my journey, I have seen so many people like myself who are also going through it, who are just too afraid to speak. Um, And that has become the moment I started I didn't always feel comfortable talking about it, but the moment I did, I remember thinking like the moment I feel comfortable, I'm going to keep talking about it because that might create the possibility for someone to see me and be like, oh, she looks like me or she sounds like me or she's someone I look up to. And if she's going, I could go too. Um, And for me, that has really been what leadership has become about especially as I've gotten older is, you know, putting yourself out there for things that might not typically look like something a leader might do, but actually creates like a lot of possibility and growth for the people who might see it. I love that creating possibility and growth for others. I mean, that to me sounds like a prime definition of leadership right there. Mm-hmm. But it, it sounds as though that only came about through, through that transformation, that would, which was not overnight, correct? Mm-hmm. This was a thoughtful, iterative process, maybe some ups, maybe some downs. Yes, absolutely. Definitely not overnight. And, you know, while I like to think I was thoughtful at each point, if you asked me, uh, you know, five years ago, oh, is your five-year plan to be an artist in the desert? I would have been like, no way. (laughs) (laughs) Looking back, all of the things connect. Um, But as it was going, you know, I had a general sense of where I was going Mm -hmm. And that it was like, I, I would like to be creatively fulfilled and I would like to still be, you know, financially successful and lead a comfortable mm-hmm. life and be financially independent. Uh, but I didn't necessarily know the exact specifics of that. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've actually become more and more comfortable with not knowing the exact specifics of like the next step I'm going to mm-hmm. do. Um, whereas when I was younger, I was like, going to work at this job and then I'm going to get another job. Then I'm going to apply to business school. And then, you know, (laughs) Um, but now I know that life doesn't necessarily always work out that way, but it does work out. Amec, uh, sharing, sharing about that mental health journey and the importance of vulnerability as a leader, I think is something that, you know, we really don't hear so much about, like, you know, like you were saying earlier to echo it, often we think of leadership as being strong or having the best ideas in the room or something like this. There's perhaps more to it. And I think uh, intellectually or in an abstract way, maybe we can understand it, but w- would it be possible to let us really be in the room with you or like look over your shoulder? W- what is it like in your experience to be vulnerable? Maybe you can take us to a moment when you were speaking with a friend about mental health or about challenges you were having so that we and the listeners can learn a little bit more about how, how you interact in those situations? Mm-hmm. Um, so the moment, so thinking back to the, the roommate I mentioned, um, you know, what was so powerful about my conversation with her was, was how she spoke about her experience with therapy, which was not this kind of big, you know, surprise, like I've been keeping this a secret. Uh, One of the things that was most powerful that really impacted how I spoke about it eventually was she just dropped it into normal conversation. So she, uh, you know, rather than this big lead up, 
um, she just said, oh yeah, I went to therapy when I was in high school and it really helped. And, you know, this is what my therapist talked about and this is like what happened. And then she just kind of kept moving on. Um, and that was really inspiring for me in that moment because I was like, oh, like it, it could be spoken about as just like going to the doctor's office or like going to the gym. Um, it took me a long while to get to that point. Um, and I remember uh, the first time I told um, one of my closest friends, a different friend that I was in therapy, I had really built it up in my head. And, you know, the kind of negative narrative that was in my head was like, they're not going to like me. They're going to think completely different of me. Um, and the big fear I had when I first started telling people about it was I was like, me being in therapy, me having me having a hard time with my mental health is going to negate everything that I've ever done in my life. I think mm. that is a big fear people mm. have, right? I'm like, uh, it doesn't matter if I went to an Ivy League school and went got this great job and was popular and people liked me. As soon as someone knows that I have am struggling with mental health, all of that will be erased. Um, and I really built it up in my head like that. And what I found, uh, I kind of like tactically, I guess, like I told the people closest to me first, and I was still really afraid that they were going to think that. And every single one of them hugged me or, you know, did the equivalent of a hug and was like, I'm really proud of you, or that's really brave. And I started to see that my letting them in uh, actually made them respect me more. And I actually got the feedback from a lot of my friends where they were like, I feel like I've never been able to help you. You've never let me support you. It's like you always kind of have it covered. And I was so shocked like this, you know, this was seven or eight years ago. I was so shocked for someone to say that to me, like that a friend that was even something, you know, a friend wanted to do. Uh, at the time, that was really different. And now I'm like, oh, obviously, like you feel so much closer to people when you support them and you let them support you. And it never occurred to me that I had kind of gone through my teenage years and early 20s, like not letting anyone support me because I thought they would think less of me. Um, so I guess getting to those conversations, it was like, okay. I told myself all the terrible thing. I was like, I'm going to lose this friend as soon as I say it. Uh, mm. Every time the friend responded well um, and even better than well, it made us closer friends. Um, and it that, you know, it is one thing telling a close friend and then another thing telling a distant friend and then another thing telling strangers or tons of strangers on a podcast. So that was like a very, that was actually like a very long journey for me. Right? The first time I, I talked to someone about being depressed was in 2013. It was eight years ago and it was five or six years mm -hmm. before I started kind of speaking about it meaningfully publicly. But uh, when I was ready to do that and I, for the record, I don't think everyone ever needs to do that. Everyone's kind of on their own journey, but for me, I, I was ready and that felt like an important kind of thing for me to do. Um, I, I, there's a tradition at Stanford Business School called Talk. And every week, two students give a talk about their lives. And normally people talk about, you know, the person that impacted them the most or like their, you know, the most important moment. And I decided to give my talk to 300 people about my experience with depression. And when I wrote that talk, uh, what felt most authentic to me was not only saying what it felt like, but actually sharing kind of everything I just shared of like, this is why I've been afraid to talk about it. This is what I think mm. people are going to say about me. And I've had to come kind of through the journey of being like, if they say that, that's okay, because the people I want to be around are going to react differently to that. Um, and for me, that moment was when I was like, oh, it, I, there were, I had so many more people reach out to me than I thought would after being like, either being like, I feel that way too, or 
I have a sibling that's depressed or a parent that's depressed and I never really understood. And you opened my eyes to a different way of thinking. Um, and I, I'm sure that there were people in that talk who did decide they respected me less, but I think even more, there were people who decided who re they respected me more. And I have kind of started to shift of like, those are the, those are the people that I'm interested in being around. I spend a lot of my life wanting to be liked by everyone, which is just an impossible task. Um, but I think as I've gotten older, it has been more and more a journey of like being true to myself and letting whoever wants to kind of come along for that ride come and whoever doesn't letting them be. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and walking us through really step by step. And I, I really appreciate, and I think it's very transferable towards to other people too, the idea of whether you want to call it tactically or thoughtfully or taking baby steps to get to, to where you want to be, mm -hmm. right? To share with those people close to you first and then maybe expand that circle or broaden that circle. And at this point now, you have the the courage to share it openly with someone who you might not have even met before. Yeah. And that's not that's not an overnight thing. But at this point now on your journey, you're here. Absolutely. And I think it like when I you know, there's so many people I look up to and it's easy to compare myself right now to them wherever they are at now, right? When they've achieved X, Y, Z mm -hmm. and they're already over here and they're so far down the path. And I think it's really important, especially, I wish I knew this better when I was younger, where it's like, what you really mm -hmm. need to, you shouldn't be, number one, you probably shouldn't be comparing at all. But if you are to compare, right? Like, you're at the beginning of their journey, compare yourself to them at the beginning of their journey. And what are like the first few steps? It's really, it can be intimidating if you're looking at like, if you're at step one and they're at step 200, um, cause they're, they took 200 steps to get there and it wasn't an overnight journey for them either. Yeah. That's straight up wisdom. I mean, when you just start playing basketball, even though I know you're a big Steph Curry fan, you can't compare yourself to Steph Curry, mm -hmm. right? You can't just you can't just go to the game and say, "Why is he making nine out of ten three pointers from the baseline?" Yeah. Right? Like, well, you got to put in the work, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> well, well. S speaking of putting in the work, I know that the amount of um, paintings that you've been doing and the amount of artwork that you've been doing is is nothing short of prolific. Um, oh wow! I've been, Thank uh, you. <laughs> Yeah, I've been a I've been a a, a fan, and um, I I'd love for you to be able to introduce maybe that briefly this this work of art that we have here on the on the wall behind me. I'll spin around so everyone can see it, and then just share a little bit about your different series, mm -hmm. uh, Bloom and Desert Minis, and your and your process, and maybe connect it back to to where you are right now. But we have this beautiful beautiful artwork right here. Yes, um, which is done by Ava. That is yeah. done by me. Okay, so I'll start with that. Um, that's a painting called Euroburos, which is, um, so I studied art and classics uh, in college, which is extremely niche. Um, but the, So this is Greek and Latin and art. Yes, uh, Greek and okay. Latin, ancient history, philosophy. Um, and the Euroburos is actually, I believe, originally an Egyptian symbol of a snake eating its tail. Uh, so in that picture, it's not eating its tail right then, but you know, that's the kind of gist of it. And the symbol uh, is it's symbolic of kind of infinity and eternity, right? All beginnings are endings, which is something I really believe in. Um, so to talk about my process, um, I painted that about a year ago here in the desert, outside in the desert. Um, I'm an abstract oil painter. I paint a lot outside and I kind of work with the environment. So if anyone is familiar with oil painting, it takes a very long time for oil paints to dry unless you live in the desert and are working outside in the sun. <laughs> so my oil paints dry in about the span of a day, which means I can do a lot more layering than kind of you could typically do with oil. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of like my technical process. And then in terms of themes, all my work is abstract, but I like to explore what I like to call like the human condition. So I, I both like ancient symbols, but I also like the idea of color palettes merging. Um, I think a lot about uh, I have a partner out here and he is very different from me in like the best of ways. So 
um, I had a whole series of paintings about two different color palettes merging of like, how do you merge things that are different in a way that keeps each side distinct, but also starts to blend. Um, so while my work is all abstract, a lot of it has kind of deeper meaning like that. Um, I think you mentioned Bloom. Bloom was the whole series I did this time last year that has now been minted as NFTs. Um, but a lot of the Bloom series, it has a lot of that dark blue. Um, and it was around this idea of like, how do you integrate different parts of your life? How do you integrate the light and the dark parts? How do light and dark parts give a whole composition balance, um, which, you know, based on everything we've already talked about, like uh, all of this kind of negative stuff I've had with mental health, comes together. it all comes together, yeah. right? Like I, would I wish that on anyone? No, but it has been a, a big part of my journey and I don't know that I would be where I am today had I not gone through that. Um, and I think at least at least kind of in American culture, we have a lot of uh, resistance to sadness and negative things, um, but it's part of being human. So a, a big part over the past couple of years has been like, okay, you know, this is part of the human experience. How can we embrace both the high highs and the low lows in a way that kind of is holistic? Um Wow. So that's my abstract work, uh, colors. <laughs> about this one About this one now, I think I love it even now 10X because it's your classics background now explains some of the theme and just now visualizing you painting in the desert. And now I think feel that unique reason, right? Through the drying and the temperature and maybe the climate like impacts the different things you can do mm -hmm. compared to someone, let's say in like France or whatever in Denmark or San Francisco. Uh, Amsterdam or something mm -hmm. painting San Francisco. Um and then also your your personal story. So I love how that all connects. That's beautiful. Amazing. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I've been in the NFT space, as you've seen, uh, since about February. And it's been a wild ride. It is like another one of those things where I didn't plan. Um, I heard about NFTs around this time last year. I was confused just like everyone else. Um but one of the things that kind of attracted me to the space was one on Twitter, uh, I was seeing all of these stories of artists for the first time being able to make meaningful money, make a living from their art, um, which I mentioned at the beginning has been like a kind of become like another like kind of mini mission of mine. As I've become more and more in the art communities, I've seen that um there's just like not a lot of business literacy. Obviously, I have a lot of business experience, um, but as artists, most artists, if they don't have a gallery representing them, they're basically running a small business. Um, and it's really hard mm. to learn how to do that unless you have training. And that has been, you know, for a while I like was like, oh, I should have pursued art like five years ago. Um, but now I'm seeing actually my 10 years of this kind of traditional business thing has really set me up well to be an artist in that I know how to run my own small business. Um, so getting back to NFTs, uh, NFTs, you know, were kind of the intersection of art, of business, of like internet culture and memes, social media, like stuff I had been doing professionally, stuff I had been doing kind All of on the in. side. And it just started to merge together. And I started minting NFTs in February, last February, like nine months ago. Um, you know, and I got retweeted by a couple big accounts, which made me sell a bunch of NFTs. And I've kind of been on the path in and out of that kind of world since. Um, I started a cool, you mentioned desert minis, uh, I started a project uh, the day I moved to Joshua Tree called Desert Minis, where I kind of aspirationally am minting one NFT a day, kind of almost like as a diary entry. So they're these tiny wow, watercolors. that's so cool. They're literally tiny. They're one inch by one inch. Uh, and I write kind of a, a two-line poetry couplet about my day <laughs> and mint it as an NFT. Um, so That's amazing. I've been doing that uh, and that I have kind of have a, the aspiration to write. I, I'm also a writer. I will say I'm also a writer. Um, and this has been a way for like my art and writing to kind of come together. So 
it's been a fun little project. I've sold about 40 or 50 of them, um, which has been cool. Like I, obviously I know some of the people who have bought them, but some other people just like love, love the desert and saw my work on Twitter and wanted to buy one because it's, it had, they had a memory here. Um, so that has been, you know, even more personal, which has been a really cool experience. And before, before we go, maybe just one more, one more bit on that, just connecting it back to the idea of putting your work out in public. Um, I know it can be a little bit, uh, maybe anxiety inducing or gut wrenching to put your work out. You mentioned before you'd put it out on Instagram and then, you know, shove your phone away and not look at it for a while. Um, can, can you share with us a little bit about for, for someone who's a, you know, a, a young person who's creative, who isn't sure about whether or not to put their work into the world, you know, what, what thoughts might you share with them on that? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'll just reiterate something I said earlier, which is when you put something out there, there is a risk of people rejecting you. But if you never put it out there, you never get the benefit of people accepting you. Like you must put yourself out there, your work out there to really be accepted. Um, And some people will like some people will reject you, but those are not the people you want to be around. And the people who are looking for you can't find you if your work's not out there. Um, I think that's true, like both for art and for life, right? Like if you just hide in your room you can't make friends with anyone, but it can be scary, right? To put yourself out there. Someone might be mean to you. I'm, you know, especially I have been kind of bullied my entire life at different points. Um, but I've also made amazing friends. Uh, and I think anyone who kind of rejects your work, that's more on them than on you. It doesn't necessarily speak to the quality either of your work or as a person. Um, and then for me, I mean, I, as I mentioned, a year and a half ago, I was terrified. It was so anxiety inducing to put my work out. And now, as you've seen, Mike, following me on Twitter, it's like I put my work out every day. Um, and it's, it's a muscle like anything else. It's like what used to be really scary a year ago now feels second nature. Um, so but mm, I just had to get the rep. I, like I just had to get the reps in. Um, and if you told me a year and a half ago, I would be posting work every day, I would be like, number one, you're crazy because I don't know how I would make that much work. Um, and number two, like, no, it's always going to be scary and it's not. Um, so sometimes you just need the reps. And I, I like to remind people, like, think of something that used to be really scary for you as a kid that isn't scary now. It's exactly like that. And at every point in your life, there will be something that's scary and a few years later, it probably won't be. Um, so it's just a matter of like where you are on that spectrum right now. Amazing. Well, a- Amac, where can we go to find it or your website? Mm, yes. Um, I would love to hear from anyone on social. So you can see all of my work on my website, uh, which is www.alexalexmacedastudio.com. Um, or you could find me on Instagram at Alex Masetta Studio, spell, same spelling, um, or on Twitter with me and Mike, at, which is at underscore Alex Masetta underscore. All my name. Awesome. And we'll, and we'll post links to those to make sure that everyone can access Amazing. them Amazing. I would love to hear Amazing. from any of you. Hey, Mac, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful to, to hear from you and, and learn from you today. And uh, thank you for sharing your, your language of leadership journey with all of, our, all of our guests and viewers. Thank you for what you're doing. This is so incredible. I wish, uh, I, wish I had this when I was younger. Yeah, me as well. Me as well. All right. We'll all keep right. in touch. Talk to you soon. Bye. 